Lab Essentials. This lecture is of particular importance to me. I work in a compounding pharmacy and we use quite a bit of the material in this lecture every day. Uh, so because of that it's important to me but it should be important to you as well because you may uh, see some of this material on your exam. So what do I want you to learn in this lecture? Well first of all I want you to learn what a class A prescription balance is. Uh, great chance that could be on your exam. Secondly, I want you to be able to name some common equipment that you might see in a pharmacy lab, both being able to name it and know what it does. I have two terms I want you to be able to know, and that's trituration and levigation. Both have two definitions that you may need to be able to pick out of a multiple choice question. Also, I want you to know two terms, USP 795 and USP 797, and we'll discuss the differences between those. In this lecture, we'll go over a little bit of, of aseptic technique, um, talking about some vertical flow hoods and some horizontal flow hoods, and discuss when each of those might be appropriate, as well as look at the additional material for how to clean those. So let's just jump right into it. So why is compounding even necessary? Well, many times you're going to just need to meet individual needs of a patient. Maybe a patient is allergic to a certain dye. Maybe the doctor wants to use a milligram strength that just isn't available whenever it's uh, made from a pharmaceutical company. Also, let's just keep in mind, almost all medications were made from the compounding process um, originally, back uh, you know a few generations ago. So it's not that crazy to do it. Many standards have been set forth by the government to make sure it is a safe practice. You may have heard recently of some bad issues going on with compounding pharmacies that maybe weren't taking their safeguarded measures to be able to make sure they're dispensing a safe product. So let's take a look at the Class A prescription balance. You can see the picture here I have of it. It's required in all pharmacy settings and it must meet some standard requirements. Whenever you look at it, you can see those two pans, and that's what's called the two-pan system. Uh, weight is placed in the right pan, and it's little metal weights that you know exactly how much they weigh. Let's say one gram. You'll put in the right pan. Then in the left pan, you're going to put the amount of the material you're looking to weigh, maybe a powder of a drug. In this case, since I mentioned one gram was going to be on the right side of a metal weight, you would put one gram of powder on the other side, and then you'd want to see that little dial in the middle and you'd want to see it kind of balance out to where it was just about right at the zero marking. Once you have that, you know you have a gram of powder. The minimum amount you can weigh on a class A prescription balance is 120 milligrams. The sensitivity, and by that I mean the amount you can measure by one notch over on the balance there in the middle, the dial in the middle, the sensitivity is six milligrams. So remember those last two bullet points because I do think those could be fair game on the exam. Common lab equipment. I'm just going to kind of go over these, show you a few pictures of these, some of them from my own pharmacy, so you can just kind of see what they look like and be able to know what they do. First one's the spatula. We'll go over that as far as how it's used just to count a prescription. Uh, a mortar and pestle. That's a very important one to be able to grind down some things. A graduated cylinder. Whenever you get a graduated cylinder and you're looking at it, any type of, whether it be a graduated cylinder or any glass with graduations on it, you want to read the liquid measurements at eye level. That means you got to get down and kind of get right where you need to see it. Uh, no problem with that. Whenever there is the water level, usually it's kind of a curve. Okay, the, uh, the, It's a little higher on the sides by the glass and it's a little lower in the middle. Whenever you read that, that is called a meniscus, and you'll want to read at the bottom of the meniscus to get the accurate level. So um, I'm kind of exaggerating here, but a little higher on the sides, and then you'll want to just read down at the bottom here on a graduated cylinder. An ointment slab is the last piece I want you to remember. An ointment slab is just a large, thick piece of glass, and we'll use that to be able to mix together ointments and creams. Let's discuss some liquids. Liquids are in solutions, suspensions, elixirs. We've kind of talked about that a bit in a previous lecture. Remember, we talked about this as well, the suspensions need to be shaken to be able to disperse everything in it, to be able to make it a homogeneous mixture. Solids will be mixed into liquids. Uh, that gets a little more into both the suspensions and the solutions. And here's the term that I told you about in the objectives, trituration. We want to reduce the particle size of a solid. One of the easy ways to do this is to use a piece of equipment I just mentioned, 
a mortar and pestle will be able to just kind of crush down, let's say a tablet, I can crush it to a powder. And you know what I mean when I say particle size is the size of the grains. Think sugar as one particle size and powdered sugar as a tinier particle size. Matter of fact, you can stick regular sugar in a mortar and pestle, grind it down, voila, you'll have yourself some powdered sugar because that's all it is, is just ground down sugar. Let's talk about creams and ointments. First thing I want to talk about is that what they're usually based in, and that's an oil base. Uh, everyone thinks Vaseline whenever they think an ointment, and that's correct. Uh, it is uh, an oil-based uh, product, and it is a ointment. Uh, creams are usually water-based. Always in a compounding lab, the even disbursement of medications in a cream and an ointment is important. You don't want to have a tube where there's no drug but just a cream at the top of the tube and all the drug is mixed in at the bottom of the tube. It needs to be evenly mixed and you can be able to mix that together on your ointment slab to make sure that it is evenly dispersed. You may need to use a levigating agent. So what is levigation? If you use a levigating agent, you're going to need to know what levigation is. Well, that's when you're going to reduce the particle size by triturating the medication with a small amount of liquid or base that the medication is not soluble in. Levigation is what you're going to do by adding a little bit of liquid into the ointment or just the base or, or whatever you're getting into to be able to make it in a smaller particle size. Um, sometimes you'll need a certain particle size so let's say it can absorb into the skin if it's a topical medication. You've seen several different medications that are kept in just your medicine cabinet at home and then you may know of other medications that need to be kept in the refrigerator. There are a small segment of medications that need to be kept frozen and here is the temperatures that these need to be kept at. For refrigeration I need my insulin to be kept at 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit or any other product that it's uh, recommended to be stored in refrigeration. In a freezer I need it to be anywhere between negative 13 and 14 degrees Fahrenheit and then room temperature I expect uh, those to be kept at 59 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Aseptic technique. Now why would you need aseptic technique when compounding? If I'm making a cream or an ointment or a capsule I may not need to be as uh, bacteria free as it is if I'm injecting something um, intravenously, intrathecally. Um, anywhere that's actually an injection into the body you're really creating a great chance for bacteria or any other kind of infection to get into the body. Because of that we're going to take a few different precautions to make sure that we are free of bacteria and that we're not transferring it to the medication that's supposed to be helping the patient. So whenever you're dealing with a sterile medication or any other type of thing that aseptic uh, technique is called for, no jewelry is permitted. So this watch, uh, my wedding ring, anything like that, you're going to have to be able to have that not on your person whenever you're doing that. Uh, if you have long hair, you want to pull that back because nobody wants a hair um, near their IV needle. Um, hands washed with an antimicrobial soap, washing up to the elbows, and then some hot water. Do it for 90 seconds. I've heard some people say they'll sing a song while they're uh, washing their hands and when the song's done they know that's uh, enough time. Whatever works for you. But aseptic technique, the point is uh, to be clean and to get a lot of these uh, uh, parts down, which is you know the washing of the hands. Injectable medications. I want you to know about different needle gauges. Uh, you'll see something of a, I have a few examples here even though you won't see them, but I may have a picture closer for you. But I have some different examples of bigger and smaller needle sizes. This one is a 27 gauge. This one right here is a 23 gauge. And then this one right here is a 25 gauge needle. So which one's bigger, which one's smaller? Well, the smaller the diameter of the needle, the larger the gauge. The larger the diameter of the needle, the smaller the gauge. The reason I bring that up is you need to know. Just think about this. Would you want a large gauge or a small gauge needle given for your flu shot? If it's a real small gauge, it's a real big thick needle. Not necessarily the length of the needle, but the diameter around of the needle. So a small gauge, which is this one, this is a really thick needle. Okay, so small gauge equals thick needle. Uh, larger gauge equals small needle, itty bitty needle. Um, so I want you to be able to know what gauge means. Uh, it, it's kind of inverse to what you might think. 
I've got all the commonly used needles right here for the different types of injections on this, uh, the bottom of this slide in a table. I've got subcutaneous, intradermal, intramuscular, and intravenous. You don't necessarily have to remember each of those that go with that. It could be asked on the test, but you might want to be able to just look at that to understand the gauge uh, concept of these needles. A sterile flow hood. Whenever you're using aseptic technique to put together an IV preparation or any other type of sterile product, it's good to be able to work in a sterile flow hood. What you'll want to do is wash the surface of the hood with isopropyl alcohol. Now what I mean by a hood is your hands are actually going to be in basically a box. And whenever you're working in that box, all the outside air is filtered. Um, you don't have any particles. I don't have you know somebody that's opening a cardboard box near me where a whole bunch of little paper particles are all around. I want clean air. So that's what a flow hood is and we'll wash it to really make sure it's clean. We'll wash it with isopropyl alcohol 70%. You'll want to work six inches inside the hood. Many hoods will have a red line six inches in. So your vials, your hands, every bit of your work will be within six inches of this hood. All vials and ports must be sterilized and wiped. So you'll have alcohol prep pads, you'll have uh, alcohol in a spray bottle. Um, don't necessarily just spray the tops of the vials, you want to actually wipe it away. That does get uh, more bacteria killed. A horizontal flow hood, there's the horizontal flow hood, which the air flows from the back to the front. Okay, So your HEPA filter is in the back and it'll be flowed to the front. A vertical laminar flow hood is usually used in chemotherapy and that's whenever the air will flow from the top down to the bottom. The air is filtered by a HEPA filter in both of these and I just want you to know HEPA filter what it stands for the high efficiency particulate air. So it's filtering out all those particles. I mentioned a cardboard box. Um, if you've ever seen the sunlight shine through a window you can see all that dust and particles that are in the air. These hoods keep that from getting on your preparations. So to govern this, to make sure that nothing goes wrong, the government has set forth some standards. These are the USP standards. USP stands for United States Pharmacopeia. These are standards set in place to ensure the quality of medications made inside a compounding lab are quality enough to be moved on to be able to administer to a patient. Two numbers here, USP 795 and USP 797. The 795 is compounding semi-solid dosage forms. So really what I'm looking for you to remember here is non-sterile, 795. But USP 797, now we're compounding sterile preparations. All the laminar flow hood and, and the, uh, the aseptic technique we just talked about a couple slides ago, that USP 797 is governing that. So real quick, 795 equals non-sterile uh, regulation. 797 equals sterile regulation from the USP. And that is it for compounding pharmacy, the lab essentials. I want you to be able to know some of this just because you may find yourself in a compounding pharmacy. A greater chance you would use some of this as you get into an institutional pharmacy and you may be uh, preparing some intravenous uh, medications for patients. Let's learn this, learn it well, and we can move on to the next lecture.